Hi, this is the first of three eating disorders lectures. Um, this lecture was done synchronously in class yesterday, so Thursday the 22nd. Um, so I'm just gonna run through it again um, for those of you who are taking the class asynchronously. Okay, so this is, like I said, the first of three lectures on eating disorders. Um, the DSM-5 Eating and Feeding Disorders uh, chapter covers pica, rumination, which we'll talk about today, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which we'll talk about on Tuesday, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder, which we'll talk about Thursday. Sorry, we'll talk about ARFID on Thursday and anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating the following Tuesday because this upcoming Tuesday is an exam, which will include pica and rumination. Okay, so during class, um, I asked everyone what they think of when they think of an eating disorder. And this is the result of that survey. So people think about appetite, um, either loss or increase, excessive or little consumption, restriction, um, vomiting, fear of food, anorexia, bulimia. So that whole kind of matches the perception of eating disorders that you see when you just Google the term. So if you look at the Google images results for the search term eating disorder, the impression that you might get is that eating disorders are um, a problem for white women, um, especially women who think that they're, who are really thin, but think that they're fat and don't eat enough, or for women who are overweight. Um, but actually eating disorders are more than that, um, a lot more. And this class and the next lecture are gonna talk about eating disorders that really don't relate at all to um, fears or concerns about weight and shape. So eating disorders tend to have a childhood onset. Um, like a lot of the disorders that we've talked about, onset can be at any age, but the typical onset, the typical course is for an eating disorder to develop in childhood or adolescence. And the you know, so-called traditional eating disorders, binge eating, anorexia, and bulimia tend to develop during adolescence, whereas the eating disorders that we're gonna cover in the next two lectures tend to start in childhood. So rumination disorder has the earliest age of onset at around one or two years, and pica tends to start around three years old. Okay, so as we're talking about eating behavior, um, I want you to think about the many influences on our food choices, um, the foods that we like, the foods that we dislike, and how much we eat. So the biggest influence, and the one that we'll be focusing on the most, is survival and health. So eating is absolutely fundamental to survival and eating is one of the main ways that humans and um, we as individuals take care of and maintain our health. So any behavior that is this critical to survival and health, of course, is going to be highly evolutionarily conserved. So we're gonna talk a lot about evolution in the next couple of lectures. But we don't just eat to survive um, and we don't just eat the absolute healthiest foods that are available. Um, we also make decisions about what to eat based on our personal preferences and aversions, dislikes. Um, in the moment, our emotions can also influence our decision about what to eat or about how much to eat. Some people experience appetite loss, appetite suppression when they're upset or stressed out. Other people feel like they experience um, food cravings or just increases in appetite when they're stressed out. So stress eating, emotional eating. Society and culture also plays a really big role in determining what we think is appropriate to eat, what we think is normal to eat, the foods that we go for um, when we're feeling stressed out or at certain times of day. So as an example, um, sushi <clears throat> was really not, <laughs> sorry, that's my dryer. Sushi um, was really not a typical food in the American diet until the 1970s and 80s. When sushi first became somewhat like commonplace in America, many people, especially people outside of like the coastal cities where it was first introduced, thought it was really weird to eat raw fish wrapped in seaweed. But 50 years later, 50 to 40 years later, um, sushi is a pretty mainstream part of the American diet. So society and culture has a big influence on the foods that we think are good to eat, normal to eat. And then lastly, of course, um, and as we'll talk about in the last lecture in the eating disorder series, society and culture plays a big role, not just in what we think is normal and appropriate to eat, but also in the type of body shapes that we think are attractive or that we want for ourselves. Okay, so like I said, a lot of the focus in these lectures and especially today and um, next time is going to be on the importance of eating and food-related decision-making for survival and health. 
So because eating is fundamental to the survival of our species and every species, eating behaviors are highly evolutionarily conserved, which means that most of our basic experiences around eating are directly shared with animals with whom we share a common ancestor. So experiences like hunger, enjoyment of food, um, also known as hedonic um, pleasure, and aversion for, food, for foods and tastes are all experiences that we share with animals. And we know a lot about the biological underpinnings of these experiences. So we know that hunger, satiety, preference, and aversion are all tightly regulated by hormones produced in the brain and in the gut. So these are hormones that tell us that we're feeling hungry. They're hormones that tell us that we're feeling full. Um, hormones that tell us whether the food that we ate is safe or toxic. And also um, our sense of taste and smell and the way that we use our senses to explore our food is also highly evolutionarily conserved. And all of these things evolved to promote the survival of our species. So like other um, conserved behaviors, so specifically like the development of fears and phobias, eating involves a lot of prepared conditioning. So humans are omnivores like raccoons um, and we're flexible feeders, unlike pandas who only eat a single food. This means that humans can't possibly be born knowing everything that is safe and good for us to eat because a lot of that is determined by the, the particular environment that each human is born into. In our evolutionary environment, it was like the physical place where you were born. Today, it has more to do with the culture that you're born into. So whether you're born in Japan where people eat savory foods for breakfast or whether you're born in the United States where we tend to eat like sweet carby foods for breakfast. Um, people aren't born knowing that. People aren't born with a full set of food preferences or a full set of adult eating behaviors in place. So we learn them through prepared conditioning. And that's something that we'll talk a, a lot more about in the next class, but also a little bit today. So as I alluded to, of course, different species have really different feeding strategies. And a species feeding strategy has a huge impact on that species range. So the number of environments that it can live in on its behavior, on whether it's a predator or a prey animal and on how long its um, youngsters are dependent on parents. For example, great apes, uh, because they have complicated feeding strategies, among other reasons, depend on their parents for survival for a much longer time than a lot of other species. And animals that have a flexible feeding strategy, like raccoons and rats and also humans, um, tend to have the widest range of any species. We can live anywhere because we can eat anything. Um, that's a huge contrast to species like pandas that have a really limited feeding strategy and whose survival as a species is really dependent on the survival of their um, food, bamboo. Okay, so think about survival and health as important influences on food preferences and intake behaviors as we go through these lectures. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about pica. Um, pica is a disorder that's characterized by the persistent eating of non-food, non-nutritive items. So foods or items that don't provide nutritional value. The term pica comes from the Latin for magpie um, because of this bird's reputation for stealing shiny objects. But as we'll talk about, people with pica don't, don't eat shiny objects, they tend to eat the things that are most common for people with pica to eat are things like dirt and clay or chalk. So this is called geophagia or earth eating. Starchy substances like flour, um, plaster, food starches, or um, ice or the frost from freezers. These are like the three most common categories of non-nutritive items that people with pica consume. But people with pica also eat like a wider variety of things. What these things tend to have in common, the most common materials that people with pica ingest are all things that have a dry, crumbly texture. And we'll talk about why in a few slides. So pica, um, like some of the disorders we've talked about, like hoarding disorder, has a TV show dedicated to gawking, frankly, at how weird people think it is. So the show My Strange Addiction um, kind of showcases a mixture of more traditional, typical pica with people eating things like laundry detergent or um, drywall. Um, but also some unusual cases of less typical substances for consumption like um, nail polish. This picture on the left is from an exhibit at the Glore Psychiatric Museum, um, which I think is in St. Louis, pretty sure. Um, these are all objects that were removed from a patient's stomach after he swallowed them. So pica behavior tends to involve like I said, eating dry, crumbly, powdery substances, and people tend to chew. They don't typically swallow things whole. 
Um, so it's not really typical of pica to swallow whole objects. When people do this, it's more often um, a symptom of psychosis. So people thinking that they need to ingest these things for some like delusional reason based on a delusional belief system, um, or it can be a form of intentional self-harm. Um, it's very atypical of pica. So what are the evolutionary origins of pica? One of the strangest of all human feeding patterns is this, earth eating. Some clays taken from special sources are rich in essential minerals. In certain parts of Ghana, they're collected and molded into egg shapes. This is the ultimate exploitation of the environment, devouring the earth on which we stand. But these clays, when chemically analyzed, were revealed to contain calcium, magnesium, potassium, copper, zinc, and iron remarkably similar to the mineral supplements recommended in Western society. The never-ending quest for... Okay, so as we know, um, humans' ancestral territory is in Africa. And in modern Africa, the practice of geophagia or eating clay is still really common and very culturally normative. So pica behavior is thought to have evolved from an adaptive feeding strategy um, of early humans in our ancestral environment. We evolved in areas where the dirt and clay was rich in minerals that humans need for optimal health and survival, including some minerals that are really difficult for humans to get from our diets. That's why um, they're uh, given in vitamin form today. So Geophagia is not just found in Africa. Um, people all over the world do it. And in fact, one of the other areas where geophagia is commonly practiced is the American South, um, but that's because those traditions were brought over from Africa. Okay, so in class, I took a poll asking um, whether people believe that clay eating or geophagia is always a symptom of pica. And the majority of people thought no, which is, accurate. Um, clay eating is not always a pica behavior. It's when evaluating whether something is pica, whether someone's ingestion of a substance is disordered, it's important to think about what is reinforcing the behavior and how controllable the person experiences the behavior as. Is it something that they have tried to stop and can't? Does it make them upset? Does it cause physical impairment? So traditional practices like clay eating in Africa are not disordered because they're culturally normative and because they're adaptive. The clay has needed vitamins and minerals. So we're gonna talk about some other reasons that people might ingest non-food items that are not pica. So one of the other developmental origins of pica, um, aside from ancestral practices around clay eating, is mouthing behavior. So part of typical development for babies and infants is to use their mouths to explore their environment. Um, one of the first primal reflexes that infants are born with is the rooting reflex, which is um, reflexively turning their heads in the direction of anything that's brushing against their cheek. This reflex is what allows um, infants to learn how to nurse from birth. So the rooting reflex is really fundamental and it's the, the first instance of it being very adaptive behavior for human youngsters to put things in their mouths. Um, it's part of the development of eating. By about four months, um, babies have enough motor control to deliberately bring their hands and objects to their mouth. And from then on, babies are constantly putting their hands, their feet and objects in their mouth. So mouthing is adaptive for babies who are teething. It helps with teething pain. It also helps to develop oral coordination and practice um, chewing and also practice the kind of tongue lip coordination that's actually involved in speaking as well as using utensils. So, for babies, putting stuff in their mouth is first a survival instinct for getting food, and then second, a way of practicing adult uses of their mouths for eating and talking. It's also thought that mouthing helps to reduce oral sensory sensitivity, so help children get used to experiencing a range of textures in their mouth. And as we'll talk about in the next lecture, oral sensitivity to texture is a really important component of picky eating, so it could be that mouthing is also a way for infants to habituate to sensory experiences inside their mouths and protects against picky eating. So mouthing is really important developmentally and it's also very normal developmentally. So up until age two, pica can't be diagnosed because it's totally normal for little kids to put everything in their mouths. And if you, if you don't watch them, they might eat it because they don't 
uh, know any better. So you can't diagnose pica in a two-year-old. Another reason for eating non-nutritive substances that is not pica is if eating hair is practiced as part of a post-pulling ritual in trichotillomania or hair pulling disorder. So when evaluating someone who eats hair, it's important to figure out if the hair eating is part of a hair pulling ritual. It is possible, like there are people who eat hair that they didn't pull out of their own head or that they didn't like pull in some other way. Like people who eat their own hair out of their hairbrush. That might not be part of a post pulling ritual, but it still might not be pica because lots of people kind of solve their hair pulling disorder on their own by using their own competing responses like for example, I had a kid patient who stopped pulling her own hair and started pulling the hair out of their family dog. Uh, she didn't eat it, but hair pulling from a dog or a stuffed animal is a replacement behavior for hair pulling from your own head. And hair eating from a hairbrush can be a replacement behavior from or eating your own hair after pulling it. So reinforcement, the reason that the person is doing the behavior, what they're getting out of it is important. And if the behavior is part of hair pulling disorder, it is not pica. The last and probably most important reason why someone might eat non so-called non-nutritive substances is nutritional deficiencies. So pica is super common. Eating non-nutritive substances is really common during pregnancy, um, which is a time when the nutritional needs are always changing and always increasing. Um, for children, children growing up in poverty or in neglectful environments might use pica as a way of coping with hunger or as a response to malnutrition. So thinking back to the evolutionary origins of clay eating, of geophagia, it's very likely that the sort of urge or desire to eat dirt or clay is an, an evolutionarily conserved behavior in our species. Our human ancestors in Africa did it when their diets were deficient in minerals. And in modern life, when a person's diet is deficient in minerals because they're a neglected child or because they're a pregnant woman, or because they're living in an environment where food isn't adequately fortified or there isn't enough food, they might have sort of an instinctual urge to eat dirt. However, not all dirt is created equal. Um, if someone's eating like potting soil, that soil blend doesn't have the right nutrients and minerals for a person. Also, for everyone who lives in a developed area, which is basically everyone, the soil now contains things like traces of um, radioactive material, lead, car exhaust. So eating soil nowadays, even though it might be like an instinct and a, a sort of natural behavior is definitely not adaptive and not healthy. However, it's not pica if someone is doing it because of a nutritional deficiency. So one of the first steps in diagnosing pica is to first evaluate for the presence of anemia, which is low iron or another nutritional deficiency. Um, interestingly, in the American South, uh, there is a history of dirt eating in children. Um, in like the early 1900s in the American South, there was a lot of sharecropping and a lot of uh, rural poverty with children who were going hungry or eating diets that weren't nutritionally um, adequate. There was also a hookworm problem. So there were hookworm eggs in the soil and having a hookworm infection um, makes you, it like lowers your energy and it also makes it harder for you to get nutrients from your diet. So there was basically like a self-perpetuating cycle where people would have nutritional deficiencies, they'd be driven to eat dirt, the dirt contained hookworm eggs, the hookworms made their nutritional deficiencies worse and this cycle continued and it really contributed to rural poverty in the South before hookworms were eradicated. Okay, and then lastly, when eating a not supposedly non-nutritive substance is part of a cultural practice, it's not pica unless it's compulsive or distressing. And this really raises the question of whose responsibility is it to decide what actually is and isn't food or what is and isn't medicine. The diagnosis of pica requires that it be a non-food, non-nutritive substance and what food is really varies from culture to culture. So it's important to understand in a patient what food is to them. Okay, so to summarize, when you're diagnosing pica, the first question to ask is why is this person eating this non-nutritive substance? Is it part of a cultural practice? In which case, probably not pica. Is it an OC spectrum ritual like eating hair after pulling it? Or is it developmentally typical mouthing? Um, next, it's important to ask, is the substance the person is eating actually non-nutritive or um, is the person eating it to cope with a nutritional deficiency? Um, 
Next, it's important to ask, is the behavior hard to stop or control? By definition, pica is sort of experienced as a compulsive urge craving driven behavior, um, just like hair pulling in trichotillomania or tics. And then lastly, is the person experiencing distress or is it causing health problems? Pica is pretty common and if, as long as someone's not eating like outside dirt or paint chips, um, a lot of the non-nutritive substances that people eat are actually fairly safe to consume. So if someone's eating flour or coffee grounds or tissues, um, it might be unusual, but if it's not bothering them, it's not necessarily a problem. Okay, so like I said, um, for most cases of pica in the in the United States in or in like developed countries, ch childhood onset is the most common. Um, and when there is an adult onset of pica, it's often associated with pregnancy, so nutritional enhanced nutritional needs, um, an illness that could, that causes malnutrition or anemia, or some other kind of deficiency. Pica can some pica behavior can sometimes also be triggered by dieting because sometimes people will intentionally eat non-nutritive substances in order to cope with hunger. Um, like I said, pica is not that rare. Um, so it, it was formerly thought that pica behavior was only seen in really severely mentally ill people or in um, people with severe intellectual disabilities, but that's not true. Um, the prevalence in the typically developing child population between ages seven and 14 is about 5% with clinically significant pica. But on top of that, 10 to 13% of kids in this age group engage in pica behavior, which means sometimes eating non-nutritive substances but not persistently, not in a hard to control way and without distress or impairment. The prevalence of pica in pregnant women is actually really high. So the estimate globally for um, the prevalence of pica during pregnancy is 30%, but that prevalence isn't equal everywhere. So across the globe, pica during pregnancy is more common in low income countries or in parts of the United States where people don't have access to adequate prenatal care. Um, pica is definitely way more common. Pica during pregnancy is more common in Africa, where clay eating is, again, like a pretty common um, culturally accepted behavior. It's less common in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. I will say, though, that even in Africa, where clay eating is like very normal and common, people can still have pica. And clay eating, even if it is a culturally normative um, behavior, can still be compulsive, can still be urge driven, can still be hard to stop or control and can still be excessive and cause distress. So it's not that people who eat clay in Africa can't have pica. Um, it's just that not everyone who eats clay does have pica. And then lastly, um, pica is really common in people with diseases that cause chronic anemia. So one example is sickle cell disease. About 15% of adults with sickle cell and as many as a third of children with sickle cell have pica. So I asked the class um, if anyone had ever eaten ice because ice eating is one of the most common forms of pica behavior and everyone had. I have too, most people have. Okay, so how does pica, how does pica develop? All right, well, we talked about how clay eating um, evolved as an adaptive behavior to help us compensate for nutritional deficiencies from our diets. Um, Sorry, hold on just one second. Okay, sorry, I forget what I was saying before, but basically we talked about how um, dirt eating is an adaptive evolved behavior. And so the urge to eat dirt or something with a similar feel and texture to dirt is an instinctual adaptive behavior in people who are malnourished. But another fun fact about dirt eating and clay eating is that it can also be a really effective and adaptive way of mitigating nausea or um, poisoning. So an example of this comes from a study of clay eating behavior in rats, which is um, a common behavior in that species. Rats in the wild will engage in clay eating, which must be adaptive because it's, again, evolutionarily conserved in the species. So even though it can be a maladaptive disordered behavior in humans, we can see clear instances in modern humans. We can make inferences about evolutionary, about our um, human ancestors and our evolutionary environment, and we can see this behavior in animals. So kaolin clay is a kind of clay that people eat. Um, rats eat it too. 
And in the study, um, kaolin clay was given to rats as a research treatment for the side effects of chemotherapy drugs. So cisplatin is a common chemotherapy drug that causes really bad um, vomiting and nausea side effects. So in this experiment, rats were randomized to either be given kaolin injections, or sorry, either be given cisplatin injections or saline injections. So saline doesn't have any effect on the rats. And to either be given access to kaolin clay or no access to kaolin clay. So the open circles are the control rats, the ones that were given saline solution, which has no effect. And the filled circles and triangles are the rats who are given cisplatin, the chemotherapy drug that causes nausea. So what this is showing is that the, oops, the rats who were given cisplatin, um, while they still lost some weight compared to control rats, they lost less weight than rats who were given cisplatin without access to kaolin clay. And what this shows is that the kaolin clay helped the rats to preserve their food intake while they were being given these drugs. So eating kaolin clay is an adaptive behavior in rats in response to not just nutritional deficiencies, but also nausea. And it's thought that um, in our ancestral environment as humans and for rats as well, eating clay or eating dirt is an adaptive response to ingesting toxins because humans are omnivores and because our um, evolutionary ancestors were not at the top of the food chain and sometimes were involved in like scavenging and hunter gathering where they were um, sometimes exposed to foods that were not safe. Eating clay or dirt when feeling nauseous is considered an adaptive behavior to help not just prevent nausea, but also mitigate poisoning because um, clay in the stomach can bind to some toxins that cause illness in humans. Okay, so PICA starts with adaptive, evolutionarily conserved behaviors that are important to survival. Clay is an effective, not the most effective treatment, but in our evolutionary environment, probably one of the most effective ways of treating nausea, and it may mitigate poisoning. Um, dirt and clay have iron and other minerals that our ancestors needed for health. And mouthing is a really common way for babies to explore their environment. So putting everything in their mouth is common, adaptive, um, not disordered. But how does an adaptive behavior like dirt eating in our ancestral environment turn into a bad habit? So pica develops through associative learning and prepared conditioning because again, it's adaptive in certain circumstances to eat clay. So humans are born with a predisposition to develop positive conditioned associations towards clay because it was adaptive in our evolutionary environment. So we've talked about what um, classical conditioning looks like before, but eating clay when nauseous has the effect of reducing nausea, which is an unconditioned stimulus. Nausea is inherently negative for humans and getting rid of it is inherently negatively reinforcing. It's inherently positive. We don't need to learn that it's bad to be nauseous. And we don't need to learn that it's good to get rid of nausea. So the unconditioned response to the unconditioned stimula stimulus of reduced nausea is relief. It feels better to not be nauseous. But when you're eating clay to get rid of nausea, there's other stimuli present. Um, so the taste of the clay, the texture of the clay in your mouth, these are, uh, these are conditioned stimuli because they, are, they just kind of come along with the main effect, which is reducing nausea. We're not necessarily born with a preference for clay. Um, we don't universally think that it's a good thing in the same way that we universally think that nausea is a bad thing. So the taste of clay and the texture of clay is a conditioned stimulus that is paired with the unconditioned stimulus of relieving nausea and paired with the unconditioned response of relief. So over time, the taste and texture of clay, even in the absence of the unconditioned stimulus of nausea can become associated with the feeling of relief. So the theory is that in our ancestral environment, when one of our early human ancestors was feeling sick because of something weird that they ate or a stomach bug, they had the urge to eat clay or dirt, which helped to relieve their nausea. But the association between that positive, that escape from um, discomfort and the taste and texture of clay and dirt created a positive association for them with that taste and texture. And so it made it, that behavior more likely in the future, even in the absence of nausea and the relief from nausea. So in class, I asked, um, based on that example with nausea, how does associative learning explain pica that might start with nutritional deficiencies or with mouthing behavior? So again, these are three examples of adaptive 
typical reasons why someone might eat a non-nutritive substance. But pica is eating a non-nutritive substance for no adaptive reason and having a hard time controlling that behavior. So it starts with an unconditioned stimulus, such as hunger or malaise, like the discomfort and sick feeling of being malnourished in the case of nutritional deficiencies, or it might start with understimulation, being bored. Babies put stuff in their mouth because it's interesting and it raises their um, physiological arousal and activation. It helps them not be bored. So the condition stimulus is the act of eating non-nutritive substances, the, um, the taste and texture of it. And the unconditioned response is either negative reinforcement, so relief from hunger and um, nutritional deficiencies, or positive reinforcement, sensory stimulation from putting something in your mouth when you're a baby, and that's really fun. So over time, this adaptive behavior is reinforced, um, either negatively or positively. And when behaviors are reinforced, they can take on a life of their own and become compulsive urge-driven habits. Okay, so this is a first-person perspective of someone who experienced pica behavior from an early age. I can't remember a time when I didn't um, feel like I had the symptoms of pica wanting to eat like napkins or things like that. Uh, I, I can remember from a very young age, um, if the family was gathered around the table after dinner and we were just talking, I would be kind of eating a napkin or eating a piece of paper. And, or like if I had a, a sucker, one of those dum-dum things. And once I finished the, the sucker on it, I'd always eat the stick that it came on. Um, I really, I really like doing that. So I remember doing it from a super young age. I don't remember when it started. It's kind of just always been there. I've definitely heard that it's linked to uh, iron deficiency and I know I'm iron deficient. Maybe that's just been a thing since birth and that's why it's, um, I've always had these, these symptoms of pica. It got most intense in, during my high school years. Uh, that's when I started, um, that's just when I feel like my cravings for random items were most intense, but uh, never got super out of hand. I never ate anything super weird, but I definitely, it, it was definitely most, most intense at that point. I still definitely have cravings um, for things like chalk or dirt or um, napkins, things like that, but I just, I don't eat them anymore. I've, I've kind of gotten over that, um, but I still, I still eat ice a lot. I would say I eat ice more than the average person would eat ice. Okay. So in that video, she kind of gave examples of all of the different influences on eating behavior in the context of pica. So of course she talked that pica is really important to survival and health. That's been kind of the focus of the, most of this lecture so far. Um, the early childhood onset of pica usually starts with developmentally typical mouthing behavior. Um, so not triggered by nutritional deficiencies or nausea, but just triggered by typical child behavior of putting things in their mouth. Kids who are chronically understimulated, either because they just happen to have a lower arousal threshold for feeling bored, or because they might be ignored or neglected more than they should be, might be particularly at risk for developing a positive conditioned association because they have lots of opportunities to experience um, negative reinforcement from engaging in pica behavior, relief from boredom. Boredom is uncomfortable. Behaviors that help you get rid of boredom are negatively reinforced and more likely to happen again, even if you're not as bored. Um, later onset, so onset in like middle childhood or the rest of the lifespan, usually starts with deficiencies. Um, it doesn't typically start with nausea in this country because culturally eating dirt and clay is not a typical way of dealing with nausea. But in countries like in Africa, where clay eating is practiced commonly, sometimes used as a treatment for nausea, later onset can start with uh, GI diseases too. Basically any situation that someone is in that makes the sort of natural instinctive behavior of eating non-nutritive substances more reinforcing, makes it more likely that it becomes a standalone habit. So in the case of the video, she talked about a really early onset, like an infant to child onset, because um, she's been engaging in this behavior for longer than she can remember. Um, but behaviors that start as reinforced by the environment, so externally reinforced, reinforced by relief from boredom or relief from nausea or nutritional deficiencies, 
become independently reinforced. So the unconditioned reinforcer that was associated with it before, the relief, the positive enjoyment, um, becomes just associated with the taste and texture of the food item or the non-nutritive substance itself. And people develop a preference, like an actual enjoyment for eating these non-nutritive substances the same way that you might enjoy eating like a favorite food. So she talked about really liking the act of eating the stick after eating a lollipop. Um, society and culture are really big influences on pica behavior. So like I said, pica is more common in Africa during pregnancy than in other countries. And pica disorder is also probably more common in Africa, although I don't think we have that data because there's just way more opportunities for people in a culture where clay eating is really normal to eat clay and experience that reinforcement and for it to develop and become a standalone habit that's hard to break. Um, but again, when we're diagnosing pica and trying to figure out whether a behavior is disordered, it's important to ask like, what's the person's reason for eating this? Are they eating it as a medication or a food or are they eating it as a habit or a compulsion? And then lastly, emotional states have an influence on pica behavior. So in the video, she talked about um, her pica behavior increasing in frequency and intensity when she was going through a stressful time in her life. And it's common for pica behaviors in someone who has pica to increase during times of stress. Okay, so even though pica is an outgrowth of an adaptive behavior, uh, the clinical entity of pica can have medical complications. So even though um, pica is sort of an instinctive response to malnutrition, like I mentioned, um, we're not living in a unpolluted, unspoiled ancestral environment anymore. We're living in a modern world where there's tons of pollutants and bad stuff in the dirt. So there's really no nutritional benefit to be gained from eating non-nutritive substances anymore. And in fact, if you eat a lot of a non-nutritive substance, you're just taking up space in your stomach and you're essentially ruining your appetite for nutritional things. So people who engage in pica to a really severe degree can put themselves at risk for malnutrition because they're not eating enough food. So some types of pica behavior can cause tooth damage. So if someone is like always crunching on like drywall plaster that can um, wear away your tooth enamel. Um, I talked about hookworms in the American South around the turn of the century. Um, eating dirt can expose you to parasites. Certain types of non-nutritive substances are harder to digest, so they can turn into intestinal blockages or cause constipation, or in some cases, they can even cause bezoars, like the trichobezoars we talked about a couple lectures ago. And then in the United States, um, especially in cities where people live in like older buildings, um, lead poisoning can be a really serious consequence of pica. So I mentioned a study of children with sickle cell anemia, 33% um, of whom engaged in pica behavior. The kids who engaged in pica were, were at high risk for lead poisoning because a really common form of pica for young kids in the United States, who, especially in cities because they spend more time inside than outside playing in the dirt, is eating paint chips. And in older buildings, paint chips tend to have lead in them. So lead poisoning can be a complication of pica. And in young children, lead can have really negative impacts on cognitive development. Okay, so how do we treat pica? This is kind of a decision tree that a clinician might use when evaluating a patient with pica behavior to try to make decisions about treatment. So like I said, the first thing that you do when someone is engaging in pica is check for nutritional deficiencies. And that's usually done by ordering blood work. And also just by asking some general questions about what they eat in their non-pica diet. Um, when there are deficiencies, sometimes pica behavior completely resolves with treatment when the nutritional deficiency is resolved. But sometimes it doesn't because again, a behavior that starts out because it's reinforced by nutritional needs can become maintained um, by other factors. So what started out as a way of trying to mitigate nutritional deficiencies can just become reinforcing on its own and it can become a bad habit. So if the person doesn't have nutritional deficiencies or if you treat the deficiencies, but they still have the pica, um, the next step is to assess their development. So if the person with pica is really young, like under five, or if they have a low IQ, then the treatment of choice is functional analysis. Whereas for most people with pica over the age of six, um, six or so, it's not like a hard and fast rule, uh, the treatment is habit reversal training, which we talked about in the context of hair pulling disorder and tic disorder. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about functional analysis. 
But really the easiest way to think of it is as just a form of habit reversal training. So when you're trying to help someone change a behavior and that someone is either a really young child or someone with a really um, severe intellectual disability who can't necessarily help you help them or help themselves, you need to figure out why are they doing this? Why are they doing the behavior? Why do they consume the substance? And we figure that out by asking about the circumstances under which they consume the substance. The mood that they're in, the activity that they're doing, their physical state, like are they hungry, are they tired, are they bored? Um, and the social context. So what in their environment might be reinforcing the behavior? What do they get out of it? And then we think about what, what can we replace it with? Is there a safer behavior that would have the same function? So we can think about this similarly to habit reversal training as stimulus control. So figuring out the triggers for the behavior and competing responses or replacing the behavior. So a case study of what functional analysis for PICA might look like in an individual with a low IQ. So Ben is an adult man with Down syndrome and severe intellectual disability. Uh, he has limited communication, so he's not really up for participating in habit reversal training. Um, he lives in a group home setting and has a one-to-one -one aid, and the aid says that he's consuming paper, coffee grounds, and dust and dirt, but that recently it's progressed to consuming small objects, so it's becoming more and more of a safety concern. So the possible functions in Ben's case um, were determined to be sensory stimulation. So for the same reason that little kids, babies, mouth objects, adults can do that too. Um, and because of the attention that mouthing objects or eating non-nutritive substances got him from caregivers. So the stimulus control for um, pica behavior reinforced by sensory stimulation was to help head off boredom, make sure that he stayed busy during the day and especially when he was around the kind of objects that he tended to put in his mouth, like when he was in the kitchen where there were coffee grounds. Um, as a competing response for pica driven by sensory stimulation, his caregivers were encouraged to replace whatever object he was putting in his mouth with a chewy toy that is worn around the neck and designed for this purpose. Um, when pica behavior seemed like it was being reinforced by attention, even negative attention, his caregivers were instructed to try to ignore it, um, or if it needed to be dealt with, just redirect it with minimal emotion, minimal engagement, and then to give extra praise and extra attention and reinforcement for Ben doing things other than um, PICA, so reinforcing him for engaging in other behaviors. So hopefully that seemed really similar to habit reversal training because it is basically the same thing. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about rumination. So rumination disorder is characterized by repeated effortless regurgitation during or soon after eating. And after regurgitating, people might rechew the regurgitant and swallow it again. They might just immediately swallow it down or they might spit it out. And one person might engage in all of these different behaviors at different times. Um, the difference between rumination, the regurgitation that happens in rumination and vomiting is really important. So rumination is effortless. Vomiting is not effortless. Vomiting is painful. It involves retching, which is um, effortful. With rumination, the food just kind of comes back up on its own and the person doesn't even necessarily have to engage any muscles or do anything, it just happens. Um, when someone vomits, the food is partially digested. So the food has been already mixed with stomach acid in the stomach. And so it doesn't look or taste uh, like it did going in. With Rumination, the regurgitant is usually mostly undigested. So it just looks like chewed up food and it tends to have a pleasant taste. It doesn't have an acidic taste like um, vomit or stomach acid would. Okay, so here is a first person perspective from an adult on what it's like to have rumination disorder. problem is that brought you to the hospital as you see it. The problem that the, the long-term problem has been that for a period of a little over two years, I've had a problem that after eating a meal, uh, parts of the food would come back up. There would be a sensation of fullness or a sensation that the food had not ever gotten into my stomach. It, 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 it was somewhat just below the Adam's apple. Mm -hmm. And along with that sensation would be an urge to or, or, or do some sort of a muscle uh, action to relieve that sensation. And the muscle action would then bring up uh, varying amounts of undigested food. Uh, my recollection is at the beginning that it happened more often 
with large meals than with small meals. But over the course of the two-year period, uh, it is, uh, I've noticed it happening uh, on a more frequent basis, even with small amounts of food. So I, I understand you that you do this. Okay. So you can watch more of the video. This is kind of like an example of an evaluation for rumination disorder. Um, but as you can see, it's a little outdated. So the diagnostic criteria that they're applying might have changed. Okay. So where does rumination come from? Regurgitating undigested food isn't necessarily an adaptive behavior. There's no evidence that um, doing that benefited our evolutionary ancestors in any way. But um, the use of these muscles and sort of this like this control over peristalsis and digestion is adaptive and people differ in how much control they have. So rumination is thought to be a conditioned behavior where the conditioned stimulus is the sensation of food entering the stomach. And it can be more specific than this. Like for some people, it can be a certain kind of food, a certain texture. It can be like, if they don't chew their food enough, it can be in a certain context or in a certain emotional state. Or as the guy in the video mentioned, it can be like, especially common after eating a lot. So the normal response to food entering the stomach is um, downward gastric contraction. So the food entering the stomach and being pushed down into the bottom of the stomach where it mixes with stomach acid and other digestive enzymes and is sort of churned up by the stomach until it's ready to be released into the small intestine. In rumination, a different process happens where gastric contractions go in the opposite direction, keeping the food away from the stomach acid and keeping it from being digested and increasing intragastric intra pressure, which is a hard word to say, that in turn causes the gastric sphincter, which is the muscle that contracts at the entryway to the stomach to keep food from, and acid from coming back up. This pressure relaxes the gastric sphincter. And this whole conditioned response that's happening in the stomach is perceptible to the person. And they tend to experience it not as discomfort because it's not nausea. It's a very different gastric sensation, but they tend to just experience it more as like a slightly bothersome, uncomfortable feeling that they're motivated to do a behavior to get rid of. So that, that, that guy described it as feeling like an urge, feeling like the food isn't completely where it's supposed to be or feeling like a pressure or discomfort that he relieves by engaging a muscle group or burping but that also brings food up into his mouth. So regurgitation uh, relieves this urge that is the sort of conscious experience of, gas, of a certain type of gastric contraction that's conditioned in response to food entering the stomach. So initially this regurgitation behavior is negatively reinforced because it gets rid of the sensation. There are also secondary reinforcements. So lots of people with rumination will say that they actually kind of enjoy um, the process of ruminating. Um, they like, it tastes good. It tastes just like food. It does not taste like vomit. And it's not, it's, it's not unpleasant like vomiting. So some people enjoy it. Um, people, little kids and adults with low IQs sometimes use rumination as like a sensory stimulating behavior. So Sometimes people will also use it as a way of um, enhancing their positive feelings or getting rid of a state of boredom. Um, for some people too, it's negatively reinforced. So it helps relieve anxiety or for some people it can, rumination can be comorbid with a weight and shape related eating disorder. So for some people ruminating is reinforcing because it, help, it makes it easier to purge. So, we talked about like what the rumination urge is like and what physiological thing is happening in the stomach that causes the rumination urge, but how does this conditioning happen in the first place? So we actually don't really know, we don't really understand this very well, except that when rumination starts early and rumination behavior tends to start pretty young, it probably happens because babies actually regurgitate a lot. Um, it's really easy for young children to regurgitate, their digestive system is just haven't matured enough that they, um, that they don't regurgitate when they release air from their stomach. So young babies and infants have more opportunities for the development of conditioned associations. So those conditioned associations and that behavior of regurgitating is reinforced by release, relief from urges, relief from uncomfortable fullness, or for some relief from boredom. 
Um, rumination can also develop in adulthood though. And so it's not always an outgrowth of normal baby digestion that involves a lot of rumination and regurgitation. So this is an example, a de-identified example of a patient of mine who was a middle-aged man who came to eating disorder treatment after a long history of bulimia nervosa. And in his case, he engaged in really frequent purging by vomiting, uh, where he would vomit every day, sometimes as many as two times a day, um, usually after a binge episode in the afternoon. So like many people with bulimia, he was sort of a chronic dieter. So he would try to go for as long as he could during the day without eating, but then almost invariably when he got home from work, before his wife got home from work, he'd be alone in the house and he'd be really hungry. So he would eventually give into the urge and engage in a binge eating episode. After the binge eating episode, because he had bulimia, he would um, make himself vomit to get rid of the food that he ate. But the year before he came to see me for treatment, he had actually stopped purging. Um, he had gone to his family doctor and finally, for the first time ever, told someone that he had this eating disorder and he had gotten help um, to stop purging. But uh, when he came to see me, his main complaint was that he was still regurgitating. Um, it was happening almost every day, usually happened after dinner. Um, and it was really bothering him because he had managed to stop purging, but he felt like he still couldn't control this behavior. And it really wasn't purging. He was never spitting it out. He was always swallowing it, um, but it was difficult for him to control. So one thing that came out during the assessment was that although he was no longer binging and purging, um, he was still dieting a lot. So even though he wasn't completely restricting during the day, he was still trying to eat as little as possible. He wasn't binging in the afternoons, um, but he was usually really hungry by dinner time because he wasn't eating enough during the day. So he would end up eating a lot at dinner. And he noticed that he tended to regurgitate and ruminate more when he was really full. So when treating rumination, um, functional analysis is usually used for young children or people with low IQs. But for adults like the guy in the video or my patient, um, it's a process more like habit reversal training. So first identify the triggers. What is the condition stimulus for the premonitory urge? Is it a certain type of food? Is it a contact? Like do you only regurgitate at home? Is it an emotional state? Are you more likely to do it when you're stressed or anxious or worrying about your weight? Um, or like for Josh, is it the amount eaten? So for him, it was the trigger was excessive fullness. And this was probably because he was so used to purging after binge eating. So his body had developed a conditioned association between eating a lot and getting rid of the food in his stomach. And it's actually, even though rumination itself isn't adaptive, it's actually adaptive in someone who's bulimic if their body kind of learns to stop um, vomiting up stomach acid because stomach acid is really damaging to the esophagus and teeth. So it seemed like Josh's body had kind of learned to expect him to vomit or purge after eating a large meal. And it had kind of just started doing that automatically. So something about eating a large meal triggered this conditioned response in his body that led to regurgitating. So once you identify the triggers, um, you practice stimulus control and you try to modify or avoid the triggers. So for Josh, this meant eliminating the dieting behavior during the day. I talked him into eating regular meals just as an experiment to see if it helped eliminate the regurgitation and still didn't cause weight gain because he was still really concerned about gaining weight as a lot of patients are. So he was initially reluctant to eat regularly but he agreed to do it as an experiment and found that when he ate breakfast and lunch um, like a normal serving size, he wasn't totally starving when he got home and he was able to just naturally eat smaller portions at dinner. And for Josh, when he ate smaller portions, he didn't usually regurgitate, but he also had a competing response that he had come up with on his own of chewing gum after eating. And chewing gum actually helped to completely eliminate rumination. Um, it's truly a competing response because chewing gum stimulates gastric contractions and digestion, which is incompatible with the act of regurgitating. Okay. So some of the functional consequences of rumination disorder include tooth and esophageal damage. So even though regurgitation usually doesn't bring up stomach acid, um, it can sometimes, and vomiting is really bad for your teeth and esophagus. But again, usually ruminating isn't vomiting, so it's usually tooth damage and esophageal damage don't usually happen from rumination. It's, that's more of a complication of bulimia. But um, habitually relaxing your gastric sphincter um, people with rumination usually only do it when there's food in their stomach because it's a conditioned response um, to the presence of food. 
But if you relax your gastric sphincter when your stomach is empty, what happens is gastric reflux or um, stomach acid coming back up the esophagus. So heartburn. So rumination disorder can lead to worsening gastric reflux. Sometimes, sometimes rumination can lead to malnutrition or undereating. So for example, if people spit out the food that they regurgitate, um, it doesn't have to be because it's a purging behavior. It could just be that they're grossed out by it and don't want to swallow it. But if you're not digesting your food, you're obviously not going to benefit from it nutritionally. Or it can lead to undereating in other ways. Like people might just totally avoid eating because they don't want to regurgitate in an embarrassing context. And then really shame, embarrassment, and avoidance of eating because of rumination are some of the most common consequences. Rumination is like pretty stigmatized and people with this disorder often find it really, really shameful and really embarrassing. It's also poorly understood by the medical community because again, for many years, psychologists and medical doctors believed that um, pica and rumination were really only behaviors that you saw in people with severe intellectual disabilities. Um, which we now know is not the case. So pica and rumination are both urge-driven behaviors that are positively and or negatively reinforced that are often associated with a lot of shame and secrecy and that can lead to social avoidance, especially with rumination. Both often develop in the context of a physical condition that increases the frequency or the likelihood of the behavior and creates more opportunities for reinforcement. So with pica, it can develop through normal mouthing, especially when a baby is bored, or it can develop um, later in life because of hunger, nutritional deficiency, or nausea. And rumination, again, can develop in infancy because it's normal for infants to regurgitate, or it can develop later in life as a consequence of an eating disorder or um, a GI disorder that causes nausea and vomiting or slow digestion or just individual differences in hypersensitivity to sensations in the stomach. In fact, I actually think I skipped a slide, so I'm just gonna quickly go back and make sure I cover that. Yeah, I skipped this slide. So um, I, I mentioned that pica and rumination both develop in the context of, or can develop in the context of real disorders that make the the target underlying behavior more likely. So rumination disorder can start in childhood and it's definitely or likely more common in children than adults. Um, it's pretty common in institutionalized adults with severe intellectual disabilities. And I say institutionalized specifically because institutionalized adults are often neglected and understimulated. And so they're more likely to engage in these self-stimulating behaviors for someone living in an institution who doesn't have a lot of other like abilities to entertain themselves, rumination is usually reinforced by relief from boredom. Um, but in outside of that context in adults, when rumination disorder develops, it often starts with an eating disorder that involves a lot of self-induced vomiting like bulimia, or it can start with a GI disorder like gastroparesis that involves slow digestion and food just sitting in the stomach for a really long time, sometimes leading to nausea and vomiting. Or when there's no underlying medical cause or reason why the rumination started, we think that it just has to do with some people being really sensitive to sensations in their stomach and being able to develop conditioned associations to kind of subtle differences in feelings of fullness where certain feelings of fullness trigger rumination and others don't because the person is hyper aware of their stomach sensations. Okay, so rumination is more common in kids, most likely can't be sure about that because there's no reliable prevalence estimate of rumination behavior in adults. There's two studies that estimated the prevalence in similar populations, the United States and Canada, that came up with really different estimates. So in Canadian adults, the prevalence of rumination was found to be 0.8%, whereas in this one population-based study of United States adults, it was as high as 10%, which is impossible because 10% is the prevalence estimate from severely disabled adults living in institutions. And that's not the population that was surveyed in this other study. So what most likely happened is that um, rumination, a lot of the participants in the study confused rumination with um, vomiting and GERD, gastric reflux disease. Um, and so the prevalence of rumination in the United States was really overreported because a lot of people were answering questions about rumination with information about gastric reflux. Okay.
So anyway, pica and rumination, urge-driven behaviors that are positively or negatively reinforced, practiced in secrecy, associated with shame and embarrassment, often start with a real physical cause that makes the behavior adaptive, but then the behavior becomes reinforced independently of the original cause and it becomes a self-sustaining compulsion. So I asked the class, um, what other disorders have we covered that seem functionally similar to pica and rumination? And definitely trichophagia is the most similar thing that we've talked about, but trichophagia is not a standalone disorder. It's part of trichotillomania. And so pica and rumination are way more similar to trichotillomania and hair pulling disorder, sorry, are way more similar to hair pulling disorder and skin picking disorder than they are to other eating disorders. And they, then they are to the four eating disorders we're gonna talk about in the next two lectures, which is why we're covering them on Tuesday's exam. Okay. So that is the end of this lecture. Um, good luck on the exam, everyone. Sorry for posting this a little late. <laughs>